when we last saw Admiral Cunningham, World War I was over, as was his role in the British intervention in the Baltic States, and he'd just received a promotion to captain. Now, let's look at his career as it progressed through the 1920s and the 1930s. His first call upon return from the Baltic was to the First Lord of the Admiralty, more precisely his secretary, but, captain or not, there weren't actually any commands open at that time, and so he spent the summer with most of his extended family in Northumberland, specifically at Bamborough Castle. Whilst there, an appointment came through, not to a ship, but to supervise the destruction of Heligoland as a naval fortress. He arrived there in September 1920 to find a slightly odd situation. Several hundred German police were present, ostensibly to protect the British naval personnel from the locals, but as it turned out, the British got on better with the locals than they did with the police. This is perhaps less surprising than it might seem. The British had captured the island in 1807 and had only transferred it to German control 30 years earlier in 1890 when the then new country had expressed concern about a foreign power controlling territory that was almost right on top of the western access to the newly completed Kiel Canal. Heligan land had been swapped, along with a few other minor concessions, for Zanzibar. As a result, most of the older population had been brought up as part of the British Empire and not a few of the older men had previous service in the Royal Navy. Cunningham found the work generally to be quite boring, but in later life he did appreciate the in-depth knowledge of explosives and demolitions which he gained by talking to the officers and men who were implementing the demolition plans. His tenure there lasted about a year, after which the Admiralty accepted that whatever work was now left could be done without a large Royal Navy supervisory force, and he stepped back into England in October 1921. He was told once again that no active commands were available, but was subtly advised that a senior officer's technical course was coming up, which would bring the attendees up to speed on all the advances in gunnery, torpedo and anti-submarine warfare, and signalling that had occurred during the war. Realising that he'd spent the better part of the last decade of active sea time almost exclusively in destroyers, he took the hint and completed the course in April 1922, whereupon he was appointed as captain of the 6th Destroyer Flotilla. Whilst, like a number of other previous commands, this was a reserve formation of eight ships, he joined the flotilla leader HMS Shakespeare at Portsmouth. Finding the rest of his ships scattered about the southern and eastern coasts, his first month spent in command was largely concerned with finding enough additional crew to sail them all up to their new home at Port Edgar which was already host to another reserve flotilla. Cunningham now got creative. Despite reduced crews and a reserve unit's fuel allowance, he managed to have the ships at sea training as much as possible. At one point, they heard that the Atlantic Fleet, for such was the name at the time of what would eventually become the home fleet of World War II, was holding exercises. Not wanting to miss out, the two reserve flotillas combined their manpower, Leaving just a couple of ratings in charge of each of the eight ships they'd stripped of crew, they took the other eight out to join the fun. In December of the same year, Cunningham was given orders to switch commands from the 6th, which was still a reserve force, to the 1st Flotilla, an active formation that was then technically part of the Atlantic Fleet, but which had been dispatched on temporary assignment to the Mediterranean. Heading overland through Europe via train, he caught up with the formation and his new flagship, HMS Wallace, in Constantinople, which still had eight years to go under that name, and spent the next few months watching the Ottoman Empire collapse and the nationalist Turkish forces rise. Whilst also trying to raise morale within the formation, which had been hit somewhat hard by the catastrophic cuts in Royal Navy service personnel initiated by the government in the immediate aftermath of the Washington Naval Treaty. This infamous Geds Axe, named after the chairman of the Committee on National Expenditure, led Cunningham to have sympathy with Admiral Jackie Fisher's ranking of what the latter had called the opposing forces of evil, namely bureaucracy, parliament, Satan, and above all, the treasury. An interesting side note is that along with Third Flotilla, during this time, Cunningham practised a night attack on the flagship HMS Iron Duke, which was coordinated via voice radio. 
This was later removed from the fleet because some pencil pusher back home decided that they didn't like the fact that voice radio made it hard to make a permanent written record of everything that was said, whereas the older and less efficient methods of radio communication did leave permanent hard copy records of pretty much everything that was transmitted. This was a decision that Cunningham Hartley disagreed with, but at this stage he couldn't do much about it. After a short voyage south, mainly to see what the northern end of the Dardanelles actually looked like, First Flotilla was recalled home and after a refit was put back into service with the Atlantic Fleet in spring 1923. This proved to be an interesting time. The flotilla was the first to be given gyro compasses and they worked alongside another flotilla that was experimenting with the brand new ASDIC. Along with both day and night exercises that involve protecting and attacking the fleet in surface actions as well as hunting submarines during both daylight and nighttime hours. They also got to work with an exotic new arrival, the aircraft carrier HMS Argus, which was practicing air operations with the fleet. Apart from these exercises there were also a series of port visits, most of which were welcomed by both parties, although one visit to the Isle of Man was remembered with distaste, largely on account of the large amounts of litter that the visitors left for the crew to clean up, including bags of half-eaten shrimp that were mysteriously disposed of in the fleet's gun barrels. Nonetheless, 1924 saw the fleet headed for Gibraltar, where the Atlantic and Mediterranean fleets combined for exercises that involved almost every commissioned major warship in the Royal Navy which was a significantly more impressive number back in those days, before they all headed back home to their relevant positions in mid-spring. With two years service time coming up, as long as you counted time in the reserve flotillas, Cunningham was due to be relieved in May, something that he resented, but accepted as there were a lot of officers in need of sea time. He was, however, sent on to a new role that kept him close to destroyers, being placed in charge of Port Edgar, home of the reserve flotillas, and occasional port of call for the active flotillas when they called in for refit nearby, as the port was on the south side of the Firth of Forth and thus pretty much opposite Rosyth. His immediate superior was someone he'd served under previously, Admiral Tyrwhitt, who was in turn succeeded in 1925 by one of Cunningham's most prolifically returning superiors, Admiral Cowan. In March 1926, Cowan was reassigned to the North American and West Indies station and asked Cunningham to come along as his flag captain. After a brief detour that resulted in his appendix being removed, Cunningham duly reported for duty aboard the cruiser Calcutta in April, commissioning the ship in May and heading off for Bermuda, where Cowan would join them the following month. The force consisted of four C-class cruisers and a couple of sloops, and it required a lot of steaming, as their duties involved keeping a close contact with the Royal Canadian Navy, helping out various Caribbean colonies if they needed help due to natural disasters or domestic disturbances, keeping a weather eye on both coasts of the United States and what the United States Navy was doing, and later, when the Admiralty removed the North from the station's title, they also had to deal with the whole of South America. But to start with, they headed up to Canada, arriving first at Halifax and then working their way upriver to Montreal via several stops in between. Cowan, having been previously in charge of a squadron of battle cruisers during the First World War, was not particularly impressed or enthused by the idea of handling a quartet of light cruisers and so delegated much of that task to Cunningham, instead contenting himself with terrifying the signals officers by making them run the signals up and down very rapidly, with nothing left flying at the masthead for longer than a few moments. They then headed south along the US east coast, to great hospitality. Cowan reportedly much enjoying watching a game of American football on the grounds that, unlike rugby, you were allowed to go after and flatten opposing players, even if they didn't have the ball. Cunningham, meanwhile, made friends with the then Lieutenant Commander Alan Kirk, who he would subsequently run into as Rear Admiral Kirk during the Second World War. Arriving back in the Caribbean in late September 1926, things had scarcely settled into routine at Bermuda before a hurricane was reported to be moving in. The majority opinion held that it would pass to the north of them. The dockyard master, on the other hand, thought it was going to hit them dead on, and as it turned out, he was right. 
On the 22nd, the winds rose and most of the squadron was found caught in the small dockyard port, being ground against the jetty masonry with so little visibility that one couldn't see the bow of the ship from the bridge. The eye of the hurricane then passed over them. This was not enough time to get out into open water, but it was enough time to rig about 40 lines, a mixture of ropes and wires, to secure the ship in place. Then the rest of the storm system arrived, with the anemometer reading a wind speed of up to 138 miles an hour before it parted company with a ship to the great wind measuring place in the sky. A nearby hut was seen to take off and vanish into the murk, along with the ship's wireless aerials. Cunningham crawled forward on all fours to check on the multiplicity of lines, uh, which was just as well because as he reached them they all parted with a sound akin to a cross between a piano falling down the stairs and someone smashing up a guitar. The stern lines let go at the same time and the ship was blown across the basin with ropes and wires flashing across the deck at head height. Only a bow anchor, which had been let go earlier to allow more lines to be played through its hawsepipe, provided a degree of salvation as it swung the ship head-on into the wind before it also started to drag. This, however, bought just enough time to get the engines going at full speed. Over 40,000 shaft horsepower struggled to keep the ship even stationary. A collection of officers and men somehow managed to get ashore, some of them swimming, and then secure the ship again with even more lines, and the Calcutta thus rode out the rest of the storm, which, once it cleared, found HMS Cape Town mostly intact but for forlornly looking for somewhere to secure herself to. Her lines hadn't snapped, they'd instead pulled the bollards and half the jetty that they were embedded on into the sea. Two ships of the squadron, however, had been out in the middle of it all. HMS Curlew, a hundred miles south, had ridden out the edge of the storm well enough, but sadly HMS Valerian, a small Arabis-class sloop, had been only five miles away from safe harbour. She rode out the first part of the storm well enough, but around the time that the anemometer back with Cunningham had died, she'd been thrown over on her side by the wind, whilst the sea, paradoxically, was coming in from the other direction. Her engines crippled by water pouring down the funnels, she most likely drifted into contact with a reef and capsized. 28 men were rescued the next day, but another 85 went down with the ship. Nothing much could have been done to save the ship, indeed her last moments were still largely conjecture on account of the sea being described as simply one frothing mass of white water, with the air scarcely any better. After repairs and various missions to help out various islands that had been badly hit by the hurricane, as well as other small cruises, the formation was made ready to sail on a grand cruise again at the start of 1927. Meeting up with a battle cruiser Renown, which was conveying the future King George VI and his wife on a tour, their young daughter, the future Queen Elizabeth II, remaining in the UK. It was on this tour, whilst docked in Trinidad, that Cunningham finally met up with the owner of the Scottish Terrier he'd brought back from Malta in 1917. Nona Byatt was the sister of Sir Horace Byatt, who was at this stage the local governor of Trinidad, hence the move from Malta. Cunningham struck up a relationship with her which they would continue by letter for the immediate future. Later that year, the formation was to be found in Halifax, with orders to remove the wreck of HMS Raleigh, which had run aground in 1922, become a total loss, and was now the source of much amusement for passing American ships. Having been told he could have as many depth charges as he wanted, Cunningham blew holes in the ship down to the level of the magazines, filled the magazines with all his remaining explosives, lit the fuses, and then rapidly retired. What had looked like a mostly intact warship, minus its guns, which had been quickly recovered back in 1922, was then rapidly reduced to three large chunks of mangled steel scattered over quite a wide area. This was then followed by another tour of Canadian and American East Coast ports. The latter so generously provided for that he found himself having to increase his daily exercise regime and decline a few invitations just to ensure that he still fitted his uniform. In November, the Calcutta was ordered home and the crew transferred to the larger and newer HMS Dispatch before being sent back out on station, heading out on December the 20th. Any hope of being in Bermuda for Christmas was dashed by a huge storm west of Ushant. The ship fought through that, with some worrying effects on her forecastle and stern, passed the Azores on Christmas Day and then ran into another storm immediately thereafter. 
In both storms, the stern was bouncing up and down by several feet. By experiment, they isolated the cause of this to the port side propeller, and so they fought their way on with only one operational shaft, reaching Bermuda on the 31st of December. Investigation subsequently showed that a steel locker had come adrift during the first storm, been washed overboard, and then become lodged on one of the port side screw's blades, which threw the whole thing violently out of balance. It was at this point, with the dawn of 1928, that the whole of South America was added to the squadron's rotor, with two cruisers of the four to be assigned primarily to this area. This resulted in quite a long tour, which sounds a little bit like an excerpt of Yako Warner's Tour of World Nations. I won't sing to you because I'm not that cruel, but Nassau, Belize, British Honduras, Guatemala, Jamaica, the Panama Canal, Ecuador, on to Calao in Peru, then three ports in Chile, Panama, Venezuela, Trinidad, Barbados, Antigua, and then back to Bermuda again. This three-month tour included highlights such as Cunningham noting the president of Guatemala was remarkable for not having imprisoned anyone for their political views, the Ecuadorian mosquitoes being so numerous that they put several signal boys on the sick list due to so many bites, a trip into the Peruvian Andes that was made more terrifying when they were informed that the return journey to sea level via train was typically done under gravity power alone, and no, nobody had actually checked the brakes before they left, Chile awarded Admiral Cowan a lance from their local cavalry regiment, whilst Cunningham met up with a Lieutenant Peña, a Chilean who had served aboard the Scorpion and was now retired. Arriving back in Bermuda in April, Cowan and Cunningham made ready to be relieved in the summer, but this was interrupted by a distress signal from HMS Dauntless, which had run aground off of Halifax. A week of intense work saw Dauntless refloated, and dispatch headed back to Bermuda to meet the incoming Admiral and his staff, after which they headed off on separate paths, Cowan to a few more years ashore before his first retirement in 1931, whilst Cunningham was bound first for the Army Senior Officers course, which he held was of little practical use to a naval officer, except that it allowed him to understand the basic workings of Army supply and establish a rapport with various Army officers. Then it was on to the Imperial Defence College, a staff course designed for officers who had been earmarked for high command. This drew together naval, army and air force personnel, along with members of the Foreign Office, with the ostensible goal of encouraging all to think more widely about integrating their efforts with the other branches of the armed services. This was a year-long appointment, which he described as one of the most interesting and valuable years I have ever spent, and was attended by a number of officers that year who would rise to prominence in the next World War. Cunningham found it especially amusing that his old fellow trainee, James Somerville, later Admiral Somerville, was serving as one of the instructors, whilst he was but a humble learner. Nona Byatt was now in the UK, as her brother's term as governor in Trinidad had come to an end, and during this period Cunningham proposed, Nona accepted, and they were duly married right at the end of the year a week after he had accepted command of the giant battleship HMS Rodney, then near enough brand new with less than two years in commission. Bearing in mind that the largest thing Cunningham had commanded up until now was the cruiser dispatch, Rodney took some getting used to. But apart from being somewhat slower to answer the helm, he soon found commanding the ship a familiar enough task. At this stage, the Atlantic fleet consisted of four battleships, three battle cruisers, and two aircraft carriers, plus various escorts, along with two of the older 13.5-inch battleships attached largely as training vessels. The start of 1930 saw the fleet head down to Gibraltar for exercises again, where they joined up with the Mediterranean fleet. The possibilities of extensive night fighting training were being explored, championed in the Atlantic fleet mainly by Admiral Drax, Unfortunately, a night fleet action did not come about, as apparently the then commander of the Mediterranean fleet didn't like the idea much and kept his heavy ships away during the hours of darkness, although very small ship actions were exercised. Upon return to the Atlantic proper, the fleet relaxed with inter-ship competitions. Cunningham was happy to report that Rodney's crew won the battleship boxing tournament and lost out in the fleet-wide event to HMS Tiger by a single point. Additional drama was provided when it was decided to use the passage home to run a towing exercise. Rodney duly took Nelson under tow, but at the conclusion of the event, as Nelson went to haul in the line, 
The chain cable snapped at her end and left Rodney towing 450 foot of heavy duty cable plus 900 foot of six and three quarter inch wire, which massed a total of about 40 to 50 tons, behind her. This presented something of a problem. The line was attached to Rodney's stern, but the only machinery capable of reeling it in, the anchor capstan, was right forward. Over the course of the next six hours, the crew were obliged to physically wrestle the line up the side of the ship and across the quarter deck. They managed to eventually get it connected to the capstan and were ready to reel in the remainder when the wire snapped almost at the capstan and the whole collection writhed its way back along the ship at speed, vanishing over the stern and sending the crew scrambling for cover. After a brief refit and a recrewing, the fleet dispersed for individual cruises. Rodney conveyed the British delegation to Iceland for the thousandth anniversary of the Althing, the world's oldest parliament, with Cunningham's duties primarily consisting of entertaining various royalty present from other nations and listening to the many speeches. He records his favourite as being the 20th speech of the day, delivered about midnight by one of the American delegation who had spent the evening liberally partaking of the hospitality. More than somewhat inebriated, he rose, swaying, lifted his glass and opened with a gentleman then having concluded that this was apparently sufficient he subsided back into a chair too much applause after returning to the uk the ship's crew were sent on summer leave and cunningham was informed that he was only to be in command of the ship for a year as opposed to the normal two this was not a mark against him but simply an admission that the further reductions in ships that were due to the london naval treaty meant that there were simply too many officers and not enough ships, and so a much shortened command period allowed for more men to be assessed for the potential of flag rank. But there was still time to learn things, and so on the way around the UK via the channel to Invergordon, the ship experienced simulated attack by aircraft, by battle cruisers, submarines and destroyer flotillas, and then had to relieve their destination port, which was under simulated blockade. These exercises were valuable, although less pleasant but equally informative, were blast trials conducted upon return to Portsmouth in November. This established that if the ship undertook so-called over-the-shoulder long-range shooting, with the aft turret rotated as far back as it would go and the guns cranked up all the way, the bridge became entirely impossible to remain in. This was somewhat little surprise to Cunningham, as it was quite possible to look a good way down the nearest gun barrel from the relevant bridge wing. Some changes to the bridge windows were made as a result, but these proved to be somewhat less than successful and the ship was left in dry dock over Christmas to patch the bridge back together again. Relieved of command, Cunningham headed home, conscious of the fact he was unlikely to get another seagoing command anytime soon. This allowed for some months with his wife before he was notified that as of July 1931, the services of Commodore Cunningham would be required at Chatham. This position, in charge of the Royal Navy barracks there, meant he would now have to sort out the drafting of crews, individual reliefs for officers, recommendations for promotions, and care of the men and their families for every ship and facility that fell under Chatham's purview. Here, his superior officer was once again Admiral Tewitt, which was just as well as the next thing they found themselves dealing with was the ongoing tension that resulted in the Invergordon mutiny which was itself triggered by the Treasury deciding to arbitrarily cut sailors' pay as an economy measure. This, at a time when sailors weren't actually that well paid to start with, spiralled somewhat rapidly, although Tewitt and Cunningham managed to keep the men in Chatham mostly on side, partially due to Cunningham opening his office to anyone who wished to come and make a complaint about the issue, which attracted several hundred visitors and kept him busy for several days partially through taking the letter that the government had authorised to retroactively explain the situation to the men and finding it so useless and likely to be inflammatory that he simply threw it away, and partially through simply being present alongside the men on the base instead of retreating into officer-exclusive areas. In a wonderful example of British governmental stupidity, it was only after the Royal Navy had managed to contain the mutiny that anyone in the higher offices of the Treasury bothered to inquire as to what effect these cuts might actually have on the men. The reports came back from the every Royal Navy fleet and establishment uniformly stating that the proposed cuts would drive many of the regular sailors into poverty and that it was precious little wonder that they'd rebelled. In the end, a compromise was reached. The Great Depression was in full swing and cuts did have to be made, 
but they were dramatically scaled back in the case of sailors' pay. 1932 came, and with it a promotion to Rear Admiral, but with no immediately available posting suitable to the rank, Cunningham remained at Chatham until February 1933, whereupon he went on half pay until, in April, he was assigned to the technical and tactical courses in Portsmouth, which was another course designed to bring officers up to date on the latest thinking. Having successfully concluded this, he was informed that 1934 would see him sent to the Mediterranean fleet as Rear Admiral in command of the destroyers. This left winter of 1933 as a time to collect a small staff, heading for Malta in, at the end of the year, where they were welcomed by a variety of Maltese locals and Royal Navy personnel who all remembered him from his time based there in the Scorpion almost two decades ago. His new command consisted of the 1st, 3rd and 4th flotillas, each of which were given eight regular destroyers and a flotilla leader. This meant regular exercises in all manner of work, both day and night, but whilst there seemed to be a lack of viable targets for a mass destroyer attack, since such an assault required the enemy to have a line of enough battleships to make it worthwhile, it was considered that the mass exercises in close quarters highlighted those officers capable of the quick and independent thinking that was needed to hold the formations together without the undue collision at speed that might otherwise result. It likewise weeded out those who were not capable of such thinking, which in turn made the smaller unit training and operations much more efficient. Amongst the fleet was his old command, HMS Dispatch, with his own flagship being the cruiser HMS Coventry. One of the flotilla captains being the man who would take another of Cunningham's previous commands, the Rodney, into action against Bismarck some years further down the line, Captain Dalrymple Hamilton. Various port visits were interspersed with exercises, one in particular being a pair of destroyer attacks against the battle fleet. The first was conducted at 8 o'clock in the evening, and failed. The next was conducted in the early morning hours, and that succeeded which emphasised still further the potential of night actions. 1934 also saw another combined exercise of the fleet. The Atlantic Fleet had by now been renamed the Home Fleet and was to sail from the Azores escorting transports for the invasion of a port on the Iberian coast. The Mediterranean Fleet, based at Gibraltar, was assigned to stop them. With no fixed point to defend, as they hadn't been told which port the Home Fleet was sailing to, the Mediterranean fleet first had to work out the most suitable target for the invasion. They soon concluded that it was going to be either Lisbon or Arosa Bay, in Portugal and Spain respectively. But these two locations were several hundred miles apart, and whilst the fleet did have two carriers, bad weather was likely to minimise the effectiveness of their aircraft. This meant that the cruisers and destroyers would have to spread out in a very thin screen instead, since the home fleet was generally superior in numbers to the Mediterranean fleet, it concentrated off Arosa Bay and began recon sweeps, as the Admiral in charge had judged that this was the more likely target. At dawn on March the 13th, two battle cruisers were sighted at the extreme southern end of the patrol line. They seemed to be headed for Lisbon. However, the Mediterranean fleet was ordered to make no changes in their position, a strategy that proved wise as a few hours later reports from the northern end of the patrol line spotted the rest of the home fleet making for Arosa Bay. The battle cruisers had been decoys. The Mediterranean fleet's commander at this point, Admiral William Fisher, no relation to Jackie Fisher, was a brilliant officer who almost certainly would have led the Royal Navy into World War II as First Sea Lord, had he not died prematurely in the late 1930s, and he decided to lead his fleet immediately into an attack timed for just after midnight. Cunningham was ordered to gather his destroyers and attack the stern of the enemy formation just before one o'clock in the morning, with the idea being that the destroyer attacks, which utilised star shell and searchlights, would dazzle the enemy and give the Mediterranean fleet battle line a chance to make final course corrections, bearing in mind that all of this was being done visually as there was no radar. With the assistance of the destroyers, Fisher pulled off a masterstroke, slotting his entire battle line into action from a favourable position without being detected until they opened up at just 7,000 yards, finishing the exercise, along with the enemy fleet, in a matter of hours. Back in the Mediterranean, Coventry and her destroyers toured various ports, mostly in the Adriatic, 
and during this period, Cunningham found himself remarkably impressed by a band of young women. They were the wives of various officers and men in the formation, and included his own. This collective group managed to work out the course of his ships, and contrived by various means to shadow them along the coast, no matter how remote the port. The tour concluded, Fisher ordered the various subordinates within the fleet to keep the fleet on its toes with sudden exercises, something that Cunningham took great delight in devising. The crews apparently also welcomed something to do outside of swinging at anchor in Malta. Finding Aitia Bay little changed from his time in Locust 31 years previously, when that ship and its compatriots had made night attacks on the fleet there, he decided to repeat the exercise with various destroyer flotillas taking turns to anchor and fortify the bay, and then having to deal with landing parties and shipborne assaults from the other destroyers during the night. Another exercise at the start of 1935 saw all 2,400 men or so landed and split into two teams and sent up the nearby hill for mountain warfare training, the only weapons they were allowed being bulbs and other soft but throwable items that could be found on the ground. This, in turn, resulted in an enthusiastic battle, of which highlights included the captain of HMS Sandhurst, who was something of a classical scholar, contriving a sling in the manner of the ancient Greeks, which gave him a considerable range advantage over the enemy, and a medical officer who was forced into a hasty retreat when it turned out that he'd set up his dressing station next to a wild beehive, who reacted rather violently when the hive took a hit from an errant projectile. The first flotilla was cycled home and then back again with new crews and new ships. The new force containing amongst others Commander Warburton Lee aboard HMS Witch and Commander Mountbatten aboard HMS Wissett. Whilst the Mediterranean fleet was due back in the UK later in the year for King George V's Silver Jubilee, there was still time for a combined fleet exercise. This time it would be the home fleet defending trade between the Canary Islands and Gibraltar whilst the Mediterranean fleet tried to attack it. Once those exercises were wrapped up, Coventry and the 3rd Flotilla were due to return home, and so Cunningham switched flag temporarily to HMS Blanche until it was time for the fleet review, with HMS Dispatch taking her old captain home to rejoin Coventry, which had just come out of a quick refit. Whilst the review was impressive, Cunningham noted that the 11 capital ships and 18 cruisers, whilst admittedly individually more capable, compared somewhat poorly in spectacle to the 60 capital ships and 55 cruisers that he'd witnessed in 1914. At the end of the celebrations, it was decided to bring Coventry in for conversion into an anti-aircraft cruiser, and her replacement as the destroyer flagship was to be HMS Dispatch, which, as mentioned previously, had already been under Cunningham's command, although now he was the admiral and not the captain. A return to the Mediterranean in July saw the growing crisis of the Italian preparations for an eventual invasion of Abyssinia developing. Along with most of his fellows, Cunningham was in favour of simply closing the Suez Canal to Italian troop transports. He was utterly confident that, should it lead to war, the Mediterranean fleet was capable of dealing comprehensively with the Regia Marina. The fleet was due to be moved to Alexandria, partially just in case this course of action was called for, as that was much closer to the Suez Canal, and partly due to the proximity of Malta to the Italian mainland and its obvious vulnerability to air attack. Once anchored off of Egypt, plans for war were drawn up. Despite their confidence, it never hurt to have reinforcements, and soon ships began to appear almost daily. The carrier Courageous, along with the 2nd and 5th destroyer flotillas, 2nd submarine flotilla and two flotillas of minesweepers arrived from the UK. Both of the York-class heavy cruisers came from South America, the cruisers Berwick and Adventure from China, the entire battle cruiser squadron along with a squadron of cruisers and another destroyer flotilla moved into Gibraltar, and more cruisers and destroyers concentrated at Aden. However, political dithering meant that this impressive collection of firepower was left simply watching troop transports and freighters full of Italian troops and equipment pass by them and in through the canal daily. Cunningham asked for, and got, one Captain Philip Vian sent over with a flotilla formed from reserve destroyers that had recent experience hunting submarines. Admiral Fisher amalgamated his subordinates' plans. The moment that war was declared, he decided, the entire force would sail for the east coast of Sicily and head toward the Straits of Messina, sinking anything that got in their way and bombarding various coastal targets in an effort to force the Regia Marina out to do battle. In order to allow his flagship to lead from the front, Cunningham switched to the newer and faster HMS Galatea for the duration. 
Whilst his classmate James Somerville was due to take over his position at the start of 1936, both Fisher and Cunningham had their terms extended indefinitely for the duration of the crisis. But as 1936 rolled around and political lethargy left the situation as mostly a fait accompli, things gradually began to move on. Admiral Fisher was relieved by Admiral Pound shortly after the news of the King's death came through, Cunningham recorded that he owed a huge debt to Fisher as both an inspiration and a teacher in the times to come. Three weeks later, Somerville arrived and it was his own turn to return home. This was to be the final time Cunningham would be so closely connected to the Destroyers, a force that he'd been connected to almost continuously since 1908. Returning to the UK by ocean liner, he was told to expect to be on half pay until at least 1938. Faced with two years outside of the service, the Cunninghams found a house and began to settle down. Although a promotion to Vice Admiral came in July 1936, this was more of a hindrance than a help at the time as the new war courses were for those of the rank up to Rear Admiral. And so instead, he contrived to stay abreast of things by means of a series of social calls to other officers who were still in active service. However, In early 1937, a committee was being set up to investigate a number of things, improving ventilation, accommodation and food supply, as well as looking into the new type of cordite that had been issued to the fleet, which seemed to be poisoning the men who worked in the magazines. Appointed as chairman, Cunningham was thus able to get back on active service after less than a year away. This was set against the backdrop of the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War and the abdication of King Edward VIII. Due to being of high rank and based in the UK, the couple were invited to attend the coronation of King George VI, although thanks to a mix-up in transportation arrangements, many guests, including the Cunninghams, were left in Westminster Abbey from about 0500 in the morning to 7.30 in the evening. Luckily, the Cunninghams had thought ahead and smuggled in a small picnic's worth of snacks and supplies with them. The 1937 Coronation Naval Review afforded a chance to catch up with many old colleagues, including Admiral Cowan, who was then in the midst of his first retirement, albeit that the event was shortly followed by the death of Admiral Fisher, which the Navy deeply regretted. Around the same time, Admiral Blake, commander of the battlecruiser squadron and second-in-command in the Mediterranean fleet, was taken ill, and Cunningham was offered temporary command in his stead. This opportunity he took and was duly back at Malta by mid-July, hoisting his flag aboard HMS Hood, pride of the Royal Navy. Admiral Blake's condition was worse than had initially been reported, and with it looking likely that the command would last longer than a few months, as had been initially thought, Mrs Cunningham was duly sent a telegram asking her to come back out to Malta again. The squadron consisted of Hood, Repulse, and the carrier Glorious, since renown had been taken in hand for modernisation and by the end of August the fleet was out on cruise, with Admiral Pound letting his second show him the sights which Cunningham had already experienced leading the fleet's destroyers, but which were new to the senior officer. But after an enjoyable return to what was at that point largely the Yugoslavian coast, it was time for more serious work. The Spanish Civil War had been going on for over a year without any clear advantage to either side, and now Hood was to sail to the coast of Spain to oversee neutrality patrols and deter anyone from interfering with British shipping outside of Spanish territorial waters, although with a number of ship owners running a highly lucrative blockade-running expedition, the Royal Navy was somewhat less interested in what exactly happened to those who actively made their way to Spanish ports. At this stage, a number of British merchant ships were sunk in the Mediterranean without warning by submarines, Ostensibly, these were claimed to be Spanish, but one look at the state of the split and rather decrepit Spanish submarine fleet had most Royal Navy officers convinced the attackers in question were actually Italian. Hood briefly returned to Malta, and so Cunningham switched over to Barham for a while to remain in place to try and sort out the situation. The resolution turned out to be a joint British and French announcement that destroyers and flying boats would patrol the merchant lanes and would sink any submarine they found without warning. The attacks abruptly stopped, and a destroyer then conveyed Cunningham back to Malta and his flagship. Patrols along the Spanish coast then followed, and whilst back on Malta, news arrived that Admiral Blake had retired for his health, and the temporary command was now made permanent. So, in between patrols, the Cunninghams had to look for long-term accommodation and bring more of their belongings over from the UK, 
which was then complicated yet again by Cunningham's selection to the post of Deputy Chief of the Naval Staff at the Admiralty instead of seeing out his term in the Mediterranean. And so it was back to arranging for all of their stuff to be sent home again. The final move to the UK was, however, a few months away, and in early 1938 there were a string of exercises, one of which pitted Cunningham against Somerville. The main lesson that emerged from that, as well as a number of other exercises, was that a carrier detached for flight operations from the main fleet in the relatively close waters of the Mediterranean was very likely to end up getting caught and destroyed, something which would influence Cunningham's handling of carriers in the war that was now less than two years away. A brief moment of levity, however, was afforded when, during a stop in Gibraltar, a rather well-informed paymaster, Captain A.P. Shaw, saw fit to supply his admiral with a list of the expected winners at the local races. The admiral backed all of Shaw's picks and came back considerably richer, as all of the predictions turned out to be spot on. It was, however, clear that sides were being drawn up in the Mediterranean, and the order from the Admiralty to entertain an Italian squadron at Malta put some considerable strain on the cordiality of the crews of the Mediterranean fleet. Cunningham recorded that whilst he liked Admiral Riccardi and his senior staff quite well, he had a very low opinion of the younger Italian officers, who he found tended to be more enthusiastic supporters of Mussolini. And he noted in his autobiography that whilst the Italian admiral was especially proud of his copy of the book The Life of Nelson, to quote, his subsequent actions during the war rather showed that he had not greatly profited by his nightly reading. A brief cruise off of Greece and Cunningham's time aboard Hood was coming to an end. One last tour off of Spain and then in August 1938 he began the journey home via France. His arrival back in the UK found the Admiralty gearing up for war as best it could. One of his first contributions to square the circle of large-scale destroyer production was to recommend the specifications of the old S-Class as suitable for adaptation into a class of small destroyer which would be suitable for escort work. This was the genesis of the program that would produce the Hunt Class, which are sometimes called destroyers and sometimes called frigates. By late September, he was settling into his new role, which was just as well as when he asked for the current war plans, he was handed a few pages that outlined a rough strategy to deploy the fleet to the Far East to fight the Japanese, with not a tremendous amount to say about what they were supposed to do when they got there. Whilst he did hold that offensive and defensive operations in a specific theatre should be planned by the local admiral in charge, the lack of a broader strategy, or indeed any strategy, to do with the Mediterranean the Atlantic or the North Sea, was worrying, especially since the 28th of September 1938 saw the fleet being mobilised during the Munich crisis. Much of his time was spent dealing with the lessons of operations off of the Spanish coast, remedying issues that had arisen during the brief mobilisation, and more generally addressing the needs of a crash programme of rearmament, everything from putting guns on merchant ships to how to best modernise older ships at short notice, calling up the reserves of ships and men, and setting up for conversion and production of ships for anti-submarine warfare. Air defence, the installation of radar, then present only aboard Rodney and Sheffield, and ramping up the production of shells, supplies and gun barrels were also on his list. He was also part of a delegation that tried, obviously without a tremendous amount of success, to deter the Germans from increasing their submarine production. Back at home, his task was made more difficult by the government initially balking at the huge naval estimates for financial year 1939-1940, to which came in at almost £148 million. This was brought on in part largely by the false economies that the government had entered into during the interwar period that had left many ships in need of urgent and expensive care if they were to be made fully ready for war in short periods of time. He noted that at this point, as well as having over 200 warships of various kinds under construction, since 1935 they'd managed to increase the production of guns and armour by 500%, fire control and director gear by 900%, as well as similar expansions in other fields, but it still wasn't nearly enough. He also lamented at this point the departure, and subsequently shortly thereafter early death, of the third sea lord and controller, Admiral Henderson, who had perhaps the best grasp of the complexities of aircraft carriers and their operations of anyone in the Royal Navy. One speculates on what a Royal Navy in the upcoming war that had been led by Admiral Fisher and Admiral Henderson might well have been like, 
but nonetheless, time continued to march forward. In February 1939, Cunningham was knighted and invested into the Order of the Bath. But now, the first Sea Lord, Admiral Backhouse, suffered a complete health collapse as well, likely through overwork, leaving Cunningham and the second Sea Lord to suddenly take on both Backhouse's duties as well as their own, which were not inconsiderable. Then Italy invaded Albania, and the Mediterranean fleet, which was at that point largely dispersed in Italian ports in an attempt by the government to keep Mussolini friendly, yeah, that worked out very well, was left to scramble rather quickly away from said ports and assemble south of Malta. The international situation continued to spiral, and with Admiral Backhouse getting no better, he would eventually pass away later in 1939, it was decided to recall Admiral Pound from the Mediterranean to take over as first sea lord. This, of course, meant someone else had to go and take command of the Mediterranean fleet, and it was agreed that this man was Vice Admiral Sir Andrew Cunningham. He rapidly began to assemble a staff from officers he knew already to be highly competent in their fields, and was soon heading through France for Marseille, where the cruiser Penelope was waiting for him on May 31st, 1939. Now in command of the fleet based in the sea in which he had spent most of his active service career, he arrived at the fleet on June 5th, boarding what was to become his legendary flagship, the modernised battleship HMS Warspite. At his disposal at the time, in addition to Warspite, were Barham, Malaya and Ramillies, the cruisers Devonshire, Sussex, Shropshire, Arethusa, Penelope and a pair of D-class, along with three destroyer flotillas led by Rear Admiral Tovey aboard the Galatea. One flotilla of submarines, another of motor torpedo boats, some auxiliaries and the carrier Glorious completed the list. The captain of Warspite, of course, was Victor Crutchley, who would later take the ship into the fjords at the Third Battle of Narvik. The fleet had largely moved over to Alexandria, although Malta was being used for refits as it was better equipped for this work whilst they waited for a large floating dock to be sent out to the Egyptian port. Cunningham then spent the next few months trying to get more defences organised for Malta, improving the situation at Alexandria, and crafting an offensive plan to deal with Italy. Whilst some in the higher echelons of government asked him to hold back his capital ships in case they were needed for use against Japan, he took advantage of there being no other plans for war in the Mediterranean to write his own, which thus became the default. Apart from anything else, he argued, if the ships were to be needed in the Far East at some point, it was much better to use them immediately in the Mediterranean when war was declared, in order to more swiftly knock out the Regia Marina, which would thus free them up for any subsequent service elsewhere. A visit from Admiral Olivier and his squadron from the Marine Nationale cemented this view, as the French Admiral was also of a mind to conduct offensive operations against Italy from the start. There then followed a brief visit to Turkey, with Warspite anchoring within shouting distance of the battlecruiser Yavuz, ex Goban. This visit ostensibly went very well, which was a stark contrast to the run-up to World War I, and the last few weeks of August were spent in exercises which were very useful in working out just how long the crews could last at action stations in the Mediterranean summer sun, bearing in mind that a lot of British ships didn't have air conditioning, and what might be done to alleviate the issues that were caused by the heat. The fleet was back in harbour, with the crews undertaking a sailing regatta, when a message arrived and was conveyed to Cunningham, who was at that point standing atop a turret aboard HMS Malaya adjudicating the finish of the race. The message was simple. Britain was now at war with Germany. In Alexandria, without any corresponding conflict with Italy, there was relatively little that they could immediately do, but there was a lot that was surely to come. With the race concluded, Cunningham took a boat ashore to find his wife and sit down for a cup of tea. The Second World War had begun. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.